Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to FinTech Festival India's Ahmedabad Micro Experience. We are back with the eighth of the 10 part series of FinTech Festival India's Micro Experiences and are another step closer to the main event in March 2022. In these unprecedented times where the world is once again fighting against the pandemic, FinTech has risen as a savior to many businesses as well as consumers, with digital lending being one of the focus areas of the industry. Keeping up with the current times and the need of the hour, our first session of the day will discuss the changing dynamics of the lending ecosystem, while also discussing in the process the rate of adoption in digital lending, dig digitization efforts in trade finance, and other categories that are active in digital lending. But before we start with this panel, as a part of Ahmedabad Micro Experience, we have prepared a white paper on digital payments, innovations, and trends. So what are you waiting for? Get your copy of the white paper from the Constellar Booth help desk on this platform right now. And with that message, it is time to start with our first panel discussion of the day. And this is a conversation on the future of collateral valuation in digital lending. And this panel is moderated by Mr. Alok Mittal, co-founder and chief executive officer in the Fee Technologies. And joining Alok on this panel is Mr. Anil Pinapala, member of FACE and founder and chief executive officer at BVFI India Finance. And as well, Mr. J, Chief Operating Officer of Mint Solutions M1 Exchange. Over to you, Mr. Alok. Thank you, Amit. And thanks, everyone, for having us here. Uh, I want to welcome my fellow panelists, Anil and Jacob. Thank you for joining us. Um, you know, there has been uh, quite a revolution in the lending space, given the digitization that has happened over the past few years. Um, from a completely branch-based model, um, or a corporate sales model, uh, much of the unsecured financing, both in consumer and uh, business domain, has started to migrate online. In fact, if you look at some of the data that the bureaus have published, uh, a lot of the incremental growth in lending, especially in uh, new to bureau customers, uh, is getting driven by digital lending platforms, either through their own balance sheets or through uh, their partnerships with other banks and NBFCs. Uh, over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, that pace of digitization has further picked up. We have seen a clear shift in customer adoption uh, of many of the digital mechanisms. Uh, you know, at Indifi itself, for example, uh, Pre-COVID, we used to see about 30-35% adoption of electronic signatures. Today, that number is more than 90%. Uh, similarly, we have moved our electronic ACH adoption from 10-11% uh, to over 50% now. Uh, and what all of this means is that digital lending continues to push the operating cost uh, lower and passing the benefit of that to customers. And at the same time, provide a superior experience to customers uh, in terms of turnaround time, in terms of electronic submission of information, uh, in terms of electronically being able to service their loans. Uh, and, that, and that momentum is now being felt across the industry. We have also seen uh, adoption of digital lending in many different customer and product categories. Uh, Indifi itself operates in the micro and small business unsecured lending space. We have Anil with here uh, uh, today, uh, and they focus on consumer lending, both on prime and subprime segments. Uh, Jacob is representing M1 Exchange, which operates uh, one of the only three uh, trade receivable discount systems uh, in the country. So we will get to hear more about uh, the impact that digital lending is having in each of these product categories. Um, finally, I think a lot of digital lending momentum in the country is being driven by the public investments in the digital lending infrastructure. I mentioned electronic signatures, electronic ACH. Uh, there is the upcoming account aggregator, which will make it easier for customers to be able to share uh, their financial information uh, with any lender uh, using an API interface, uh, and hence reduce the friction that today digital lenders face in collection of that kind of information. Uh, similarly, there is the open credit enablement network, which has just been launched, uh, and that promises to uh, do what UPI did to payments, essentially create interoperability uh, using open standards uh, between originators of loans, uh, underwriters, uh, balance sheet providers, and hence really provide an operating system uh, to interconnect these various parties that are involved in a digital lending transaction. 
so we will delve into some of these topics uh, deeper in our discussion today. Uh, but with that, let me first uh, invite our panelists for their opening remarks. Uh, we can start with Jacob uh, and then Anil Shubhik Day to get your your remarks on the topic. Hey, uh, thanks, Alok. Thanks, Amit uh, and Anil uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so uh, at M1 Exchange, uh, we started uh, way back in 2017. Uh, we started with transaction volumes per month uh, of 7 crores, 10 crores. Uh, two years back, we were doing at 400 crores, 300 crores. And right now, we are in the range of 1,300 crores to 1,500 crores a month. Uh, so it has it has uh, gone up, come up really well. The market has adopted it. The customers are finding a lot of value in this. And uh, I remember the the transformation we could bring on the on the factoring transactions. So technically, the transactions are uh, structured in a way where the supplier, who is an MSME, he is selling his receivable to a financier. Okay, so typically, for example, uh, let's imagine uh, uh, Gupta and company, a small MSME, he uh, supplies material to uh, a large corporate, say, uh, Indian Oil. And uh, he can upload the invoice then and there to our platform. Uh, we will confirm uh, from Indian Oil that that's a genuine invoice. And then we put it up for auction amongst all the banks. So today, almost 40 banks participate in that auction. And uh, he will, he can, Gupta and company, the small MSME can choose from the multiple bids, the lowest uh, uh, bid and uh, confirm that to us. And we transfer the payable or the, the bill value from the financier to Gupta and company uh, the next day morning. And on the due date, we collect it from Indian oil and pay back to the financier. So that's the model what we run. And we uh, disburse to the tune of uh, 1,300 to 1,500 crores a month, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. So this uh, earlier, uh, which is a typical factoring, uh, was, was very uh, uh, difficult for a customer to access. Uh, first of all, he has to go to a bank. Bank will ask for a ledger audit. After ledger audit, uh, he needs a verification from the buyer. Uh, there's an NOA to be signed by the buyer so on and so forth and and still that used to be riddled with a lot of uh, loopholes and a lot of uh, uh, systemic issues uh, which uh, later uh, became uh, large uh, uh, lending problems in terms of NPA accumulation and so on and so forth whereas uh, once we digitize the whole process uh, the, the user experience uh, tremendously improved the credit quality improved tremendously the fraud prevention mechanisms were uh, solid and uh, the uh, that that resulted in this kind of adoption both from the financial side and from the uh, uh, corporates and from the msmes so so uh, digital uh, is 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 a uh, enabling uh, or democratizing the liquidity uh, to the smaller uh, customers uh, which uh, on a bilateral basis was very difficult uh, for the banking system to uh, reach to or to provide to the locations to to give a geographical perspective today we have transactions originating out of uh, 600 to 700 uh, small towns and villages uh, imagine that uh, being put across to a branch network uh, as in the old system uh, the kind of cost that would uh, uh, pile up uh, on the on the financier so, so, so this has become a very cost-effective uh, liquidity distribution system uh, for all the transactions for uh, the MSMEs. Uh, uh, please, uh, I'll, I'll uh, transfer to the uh, to Anil and Alok uh, for the opening remarks. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, Anil, please go ahead. Hello, uh, thanks for uh, FinTech Festival of India for having me on this panel along with Jacob. Uh, and thanks, Amit, for the introductions. Uh, I mean, uh, my opening remarks will rem uh, mirror uh, both the panelists who have spoken so far. Um, digital lending has exploded. I mean, there are no two ways to talk about it. Jacob has talked about an amazing growth story with M1 Exchange. Um, our experience uh, with Vivify has been similar. We operate primarily um, in the consumer uh, lending market. Our focus area is to um, is uh, low-income consumers, 
but typically underserved or unserved uh, in in first while world uh, with the traditional banks and NBFCs. We are talking about customers with low incomes, uh, income to below 30,000 rupees. Um, more than half of our customers have an income below 20,000 rupees. Um, and uh, we are talking about customers who are stressed um, in terms of poor credit history or uh, customers who are completely new to credit or new to bureau. Um, and uh, apart from these, uh, we are also talking about customers who are not necessarily uh, from uh, uh, more than half of our customers are from tier three or uh, lower. Today, we serve over 10,000 zip codes um, and uh, 10,000 postal codes. And all of this has been possible uh, only because of the digital means uh, onboarding and servicing the customer, which we come. We do with our branch flex pay and flex salary. And um, we are able to reach out to the consumers and do a very small loan. And some of our loans are really small uh, loans, as well as 4,000 loans as much as in a retail environment. And we would not have been able to onboard or administer those loans in a uh, branch environment because the cost would have been uh, prohibitively high to manage those loans. And But we have been able to offer it mainly because of the ecosystem, like Alok pointed out. India has one of the most sophisticated ecosystems in the world, uh, be it Aadhaar, uh, which, I mean, we can use in limited fashion, with e-sign, uh, be it uh, uh, the PAN infrastructure, uh, the uh, DST uh, digitization. We are talking about um, the entire mandate registration process that has been digitized. All of those has been uh, have been uh, great uh, foundational tools that have been available, which are not available so easily in any other market. We kind of take it for granted in India. Uh, and on top of it, the regulator, um, I keep saying this every time, is a disruptor in our uh, space. Like there is, we, we are blessed with one of the most uh, uh, sophisticated payment systems in the world with UPI. And uh, to kind of talk about how all of this has enhanced, uh, we used to get, uh, when we started out about three years ago, um, maybe a few thousand applications a month. Today, we are uh, getting over five lakh applications a month. And uh, these applications come all the way from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and Kutch to Kalkat. So, um, and we are able to service each of these consumers because we have the ability to into these multiple uh, uh, multiple uh, e e enabling technologies that have been provided either through the regulator themselves or uh, through agencies that are uh, available to the regulator and the credit bureau infrastructure that has uh, really enhanced in these last few years. And our ex experience uh, mirrors uh, all of them, uh, on the e-signature. Today we have a nearly 95% uh, e-signature rate our region in our trade is almost 75, uh, over 75 percent. And, and in COVID, in many ways, has accelerated this adoption. We already were seeing a mobile first and mobile kind of approach for uh, new borrowers. But COVID has definitely accelerated this process. And um, UPI um, has helped a lot uh, in uh, further enabling this because today, more than 75% of our customer payments come through you, which is an amazing tool when you think about it. That And we are one of the first companies to launch a UPI out of it. So we are talking about mandate registration that is now enabled on UPI. When you're talking about customers who are, um, when, I, when I talk about a 4,000 rupee loan, those customers, they're all today using a mobile phone and are doing UPI transactions. Now, if I am able to access payments or uh, enable credit on UPI to those consumers, that's the power that uh, enables us to grow exponentially. And uh, uh, having said all of this, we all know uh, who are in the space that this is still, we are still scratching the surface. Um, there is a huge potential. Um, uh, I mean, digital lending still forms a very small portion of the overall lending. And, um, uh, but uh, uh, we also are seeing a shift where uh, it's not just fintechs and new age players who are here, but uh, everybody is a digital lender. 
banks and traditional NBFCs, everybody has digital uh, mediums of onboarding consumers and digitally servicing consumers because that is the need of the hour and that's where the consumers are. So, um, I mean, there will be, as time progresses, little distinction between a, a legacy player versus a new player because everyone mm -hmm. will be offering services on similar levels. So, um, and I'm sure um, all my panelists will agree that we are in for exciting times for us as uh, players within the space. And for consumers, I think uh, they will have a plethora of choice as uh, as digital lending experts. Thank you, Anil. Uh, and uh, one uh, request to our audience, uh, please do keep your questions coming in. Uh, you know, As much as possible, we would like to focus our discussion on topics that you are thinking about. Uh, so, you know, please feel free to write in. Uh, we will take them uh, as the discussion progresses. Uh, Jacob, Anil, thanks for thanks for your opening remarks. You know, one of the things that uh, we see a fairly, you know, diverse view on is where is the impact of digitization showing up the most? What are the areas where the impact is still uh, suboptimal? So, if you look at the lending value chain. Uh, of you know originating a customer um, you know collecting information credit decisioning uh, onboarding you know life cycle management collections uh, what are the areas where you've seen uh, a disproportionate impact uh, because of the digital mechanisms and what are the areas where you're still looking for uh, solutions uh, in in how to automate and digitize those processes Uh, should I go first? Please, Anil. Okay. Yeah, uh, see, uh, Alok, I, I think it's a bit um, um, uh, of a, for us, everything is completely digital right now, um, especially uh, since COVID, uh, since we moved away from the physical signature process and uh, the KYC process. Um, uh, if I have to really pick an area where um, we would expect to better utilize the tools that the ecosystem provides is the KYC process. I think um, um, either uh, uh, we are all aware that uh, to a certain degree, the EKYC, uh, the lack of EKYC kind of has uh, provided a greater challenge. Obviously, mm -hmm. we are all, uh, most of us have shifted video KYC, but it still uh, is a barrier, right? Uh, so that's a big area uh, that, uh, yeah. I mean, if we are able to, utilize whatever the ecosystem already has um, and and are able to uh, use it to reach out to more and more consumers. Uh, when we are talking about doing a 4,000 rupee loan to someone uh, living in uh, rural Andhra Pradesh or rural Telangana or uh, rural Uttar Pradesh and you are a lender sitting in Hyderabad, um, to do effective KYC um, and um, kind of aligning with the government's digital vision of a digital India and financial inclusion that is driven by digital, we should be able to use all the tools that are available to us. And um, and that will be something that would really enable us. Uh, but in, in terms of the process today, we are completely digital, as I said, with uh, video KYC as the base uh, for the KYC process. Um, we used to do a lot of, uh, I mean, we, we still do a bit of signature because um, not everybody e-signs the documents all the time, um, but uh, there will, I mean, we are trying to overcome that barrier. And uh, uh, the other barrier that uh, we kind of see as a big challenge for us as a company, but everyone in the industry should solve that, is right now the entire uh, ecosystem or the entire digital lending industry is addressing only the educate or the literate, right? Like. Um, because there is a form filling process that needs to happen. And uh, sometimes literacy could become a barrier in itself when you are unable to fill that form. And that's a challenge that we are taking very seriously where we are looking at video and voice based on coding so that um, whether literacy, whether it's digital or overall, should not be a barrier in accessing providing access to credit. Got it. Uh, Jacob, any thoughts on where yes, are you seeing? Uh, I'm, I, in fact, I, I was, I'm thrilled that you asked this question because, uh, uh, you know, one very interesting piece I remember is when we uh, when we were starting off, we had drawn up what are the advantages it would provide to our uh, MSME suppliers. Okay. And then uh, our marketing team and our sales team uh, compiled all that. 
And uh, the surprising thing is uh, there were a lot of media coverage on Treads when it started. The media started going and interviewing people and all that. And the biggest, uh, most repeated feedback they got from the MSME supplier is that, sir, my turnover has doubled. My turnover has grown up three times. And, and we, we never envisaged that in the first place. So, so the biggest impact is we could reach liquidity to the MSMEs where mm -hmm. it was not available previously. Uh, so, so the people had uh, uh, feedbacks like uh, their turnover going up three times and four times. So that was the biggest impact because MSMEs uh, as, a, as a segment were getting funded only with uh, uh, collateral, hard collaterals. And uh, Treads was uh, one uh, format where they could uh, get unsecured funding. With hard collateral, the, the maths is something like this. It's a, the collateral is also a function of your net profits. And uh, MSMEs typically net profits are in the range of one, one and a half percent or two percent max max. And their growth aspirations are in the range of 25 percent, 40 percent. No MSME wants to grow at uh, one and a half, two percent. So you necessarily need unsecured capital. And that was made available. So that's the biggest impact. We could make available uh, the cap unsecured capital for the MSMEs. Secondly, the, the rate at which it goes. So today, a supplier of Indian oil or uh, any of the AAA rated uh, companies uh, get uh, funding in the range of uh, say anywhere between three and a half to four and a half percent. Whereas is normal working capital uh, uh, funding would come at uh, at least 10 percent higher than that. OK, because the cost assist, uh, uh, cost uh, associated with assessing his uh, profile, assessing, making that loan available by a branch based banking is so high. Uh, so so uh, a normal bank will not be able to uh, provide this kind of uh, interest rates. And uh, uh, thirdly, the speed at which it is made available. So, so uh, today we, uh, we can onboard a customer in 15 minutes flat. A video KYC done, uh, his registration done, and we take only two parameters from the customer. We take only his mobile number, uh, OTP is given, then we ask him to punch in his PAN number. Whoops, uh, you have the full application form filled up. We are connected with Udyam, we are connected with uh, uh, MCA, we, we pull in details from all the websites possible and give him a pre-filled application and you can just affix his digital signature and you are registered. So the turnaround time for him to access funding is mm -hmm. 15 minutes. <laughs> So, so, so these are the few uh, points that uh, come to uh, top of my mind on the impact side. Thank you. Uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the audience uh, has asked is also very interesting. You know, digital lending has not just meant uh, technology innovation, right? Uh, the partnership landscape actually has evolved uh, because there is digitization, API connectivity. Uh, you know, we ourselves uh, originate bulk of our business through partnerships with large online platforms. We deliver bulk of our business with partnerships with banks and other NBFCs. Uh, where, where have you seen the partnerships play out? What are the challenges um, and opportunities you're seeing on, on that front? Jacob, maybe we can start this one with you. Sure. So we, we uh, do have partnerships with a lot of other supply chain platforms where uh, uh, people, uh, where the corporates have uh, registered themselves on uh, some, some, some of them are dynamic discounting platforms. We have partnerships with GEMS, uh, which you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks. Uh, so, so do the transactions do flow in from uh, accounting softwares, from supply chain platforms, from uh, GEM portals, from e-commerce platforms and so forth. Uh, even there are uh, uh, clients of banks and uh, uh, other financiers uh, uh, who are uh, passed on to us because it uh, helps uh, both the institutions uh, uh, to have increased business through the uh, trades model. So, so partnerships are, of course, very important because uh, the whole idea is to reach uh, uh, as much uh, far and wide as possible and uh, uh, setting up an entire organization to, the, to, to, to manage that reach will uh, increase your cost tremendously. So partnerships is one way where you can keep your cost down and uh, get your reach uh, uh, as much as possible. Anil, are there areas where you are leveraging partnerships to you know, grow the business faster? Yeah, um, I mean, I would treat the partnerships at two levels. One is Obviously, the entire technology ecosystem, the partnerships you have with various, either with banks or service providers that enable you to de deliver a seamless experience. I think that itself is a great value 
but apart from that, uh, we are building a huge partnership network that is uh, um, uh, offline, uh, mainly related to uh, uh, at, uh, once more at two levels. One is related to the employers because we offer ourselves as a benefit to the employers. Uh, so companies that want to provide salary advances to their uh, employees without having to necessarily take the credit risk. So that's the area of partnership that we are uh, growing aggressively. In. And the second area is where, um, apart from the online merchant partnerships, which many other digital lenders have, we are building a very strong uh, pipeline of offline merchant partnerships, um, starting from the smallest Kiranas, where we are trying to take away the credit risk of the Kirana, because we all know that the most uh, neighborhood uh, grocery stores um, are a carrier of credit for uh, many of the families within that uh, neighborhood. And um, our core value proposition is most of them are our customers. So why do you want to take the credit risk? We'll take the credit risk. You take over. You kind of do what's core to your business. So that's the other area of partnership uh, we are trying to put as a means of uh, accelerating. Yeah, I think that that's fascinating because you know both of you spoke about uh, you know distribution partnerships as one of the core areas. Uh, you know, we do ecosystem lending again. Distribution has been a core area of partnership. So one of the uh, business model elements that seem to be getting transformed because of digitization um, and you know connectivity uh, seems to be the distribution leg, right? So if you kind of roll back even five years, you know uh, the branch-based distribution. Uh, is kind of what what has ruled the lending space forever uh, and now these partnerships are providing with both more efficient and more scalable uh, distribution um, and uh, from the other perspective allowing many people who did not have access to financing to really be able to access financing through through such uh, channels uh, so the inclusion uh, you know promise of digital lending obviously is driven by cost seamlessness but perhaps also by uh, almost an explosion in access channels for my customer uh, in how they can access uh, financing. One of the areas which uh, comes in, you know, comes under pressure when when the customer data is flowing around, obviously, is the privacy of the customer data. Who knows what? Um, you know, what are the best practices that you are setting in place uh, to make sure that the you know customer privacy and data interests are still protected? Uh, Anil, maybe you can go first on this one. Uh, look, uh, I mean, privacy, as you said, is a very important uh, aspect and uh, something that we take to heart. Um, I've uh, built digital lending businesses in the US before I moved here, and we have adopted a lot of those best practices. Consent is very important. Um, I think uh, there is a very great initiative overall, uh, as we all know, with Sahmati as a layer. Um, and with the account aggregator uh, framework, once it comes into place, that itself kind of transfers uh, um, a lot of, instead of disparate um, uh, partners that we work with today, um, having a single interface wherein the customer's consent is clear and uh, undeniable would be a great uh, further step to enhance that transparency. Um, so we uh, make sure that our customers understand what is the data that they are sharing and why are they sharing the data. Um, and we also don't uh, ask for any data which uh, we think is, uh, I mean, be, be their contact information or be their, uh, because there is a lot of uh, access you get from the device data, but we feel very, very responsible with it. And there is clear transparency and communication to consumers. So, um, and all the data, apart from just uh, the transparency to the consumer, once you have the data with you, there is a responsibility to ensure security, right? Like so, um, the protocols by which we get the data, how the data is stored in encrypted format when it's resting within your data environment and making sure that data environment is secure is another thing. And uh, all of this should be uh, regularly tested, audited uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, either OWASP or other security guidelines. So we follow all of that to make sure, one, our consumers understand why they are giving data and two, they have the faith that the data is in secure hands once we have. Yeah, I think one of the challenges that does come up is, uh, you know, in the partnership model, if the customer is still uploading data on your direct interface, you know, then that control can get exercised. Uh, but there are relationships where these uh, distribution partnerships really are, in some sense, offline. They are collecting information and then passing information. 
so whether you know there are business correspondent networks or you look at you know a uh, partnership with let's say a post office system where uh, the postman is going and collecting data and then you know uh, forwarding data and uh, there might be need to kind of regulate those pieces better to make sure that that data is not getting misused uh, jacob i would imagine in your case given that you got relatively sophisticated users on both ends of the exchange uh, this might be less of a problem but how do you regulate that internally yeah, more than that uh, we are fully regulated uh, by rbi so rbi has very stiff norms on uh, the data security and uh, privacy so we follow all those norms and uh, you know it's actually even a higher level than that of banks in many cases because at times we we have faced this problem because we integrate with uh, certain large corporates uh, the, which are uh, already connected with a banking uh, payment system uh, with their erp or something uh, because our security protocols are of much higher level Uh, hmm. we have to request the banks to upgrade their <laughs> security levels to match it only then the erp can be so, so some of our erp integrations get delayed at, for that level that that hmm. reason hmm. Uh, because the whole uh, system has to be upgraded to uh, next level of security and uh, it is all clearly defined uh, by the rbi and the banking norms so so we are completely compliant with that and there's no way uh, there can be any deviation on that piece understand understand uh just shifting gears a little bit i think the, the other kind of concern that's been expressed uh, around digital lending is just stabilization of credit cost you know will the credit cost numbers look much higher because there is no human interface uh in many times not even in collections you know certainly not at the time of origination um and again i think some of the businesses represented on the panel may be operating at the you know extreme ends of that uh you know we ourselves don't look at risk as something that needs to get minimized but something that needs to get priced right so there's a very different approach to looking at risk uh than what has conventionally existed and sure enough you know as long as we can make uh, the required return on assets at different uh, risk and price points uh you know we feel good about it even though for a conventional banking professional that may look like we are taking undue risk um anil uh, how do you manage you know risk when you are going to subprime customers you know even stress customers what is your philosophy for managing risk yeah i mean um, at the core of the philosophy is not very different from what you have just said but, uh, uh, obviously risk is something that needs to get priced um and uh, as long as you have appropriately priced it and the communication is done, being done in a transparent fashion to the consumer so they know what they are getting into i think uh, that is a very important uh, aspect of how you price your product that it's not hidden or it's not uh, concealed uh, the consumer in any form but uh, apart from that see when you are uh, trying to go uh, to slightly deeper segments in terms of uh, customers with lower incomes customers with stressed history it obviously comes with some uh a certain level of at certain higher level of risk there is a reason that the banks and traditional nbfcs have not given loans to these consumers because they they, they don't expect the same kind of repayment uh, behavior uh, that you expect from uh, your prime consumer segments having said that uh, what we have realized in one of the most important tools in managing risk is education especially with consumers especially consumers who are new to credit it is helping them understand the value of timely repayment not just repayment but timely repayment and how it will help them enhance their credit score and get them other access to better products right like if you want to get an auto loan or if you want to get a home loan somewhere down the line uh, defaulting on a 10000 rupee or a 50000 rupee loan is not the best way to get up okay. and that's the messaging is a very important part of managing risk and education is a very important part of managing risk and that's how we do it um but at the same time having said all of this um uh, i completely agree with you that pricing is a big factor in it and uh, something that um, hopefully uh, the local uh, wholesale lend community and securitization aspect of the land, you know, will start to factor that in more uh, uh, appropriately and uh, not see an npn number in isolation as a reflection of how well the company is run 
Yeah. Jacob, I think you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You're saying give me some more risk, right? So now industries are being allowed to participate on trades. Right, um, right, right. Uh, but we have incorporated uh, our uh, uh, pattern mapping, uh, dedupe uh, checking, various fraud prevention uh, algorithms we have built in into the system. Uh, we do uh, customer screening uh, by ourselves, apart from the due diligence of the financiers. So there are a lot of uh, risk mitigant measures uh, the platforms uh, undertake uh, at the back end. Uh, we are aware of it. Uh, today, everything is hunky dory. We have had, uh, you know, 0. 0. 0.000 <laughs> levels of uh, uh, defaults or delays. Uh, but uh, we are not letting our guard down there. Uh, we are vigilant and uh, we do screening of customers and we do have various algorithms which check for uh, the uh, the peak uh, season uh, throughput, mm -hmm. the uh, growth over the previous year and so on and so forth. Various patterns of uh, transactions are mapped and uh, anything out of pattern is uh, uh, checked by compliance and if required, then reported back to uh, RBI as suspicious transactions. Understand, understand. Uh, fascinating discussion, and we could, you know, we could go on on this uh, uh, for some more time. But I do realize that we are coming to the uh, end of the session. Um, I would love to get, uh, you know, one closing remark from each of you, uh, you know, and especially uh, addressing uh, a the fintech entrepreneurs in the audience, and b uh, some of our friends and colleagues from the banking uh, sector. You know, what would your uh, advice and suggestion to them be? Uh, Jacob, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. So the potential uh, is uh, humongous. Uh, that is what I, I, I'd say the rate of growth which we see uh, and the adoption uh, uh, is, is tremendous because uh, two years back or three years back, I wouldn't have been uh, uh, so excited and uh, uh, you know confident to speak on this. But right now, the, the kind of response I get from the market is, is tremendous. So uh, please don't hesitate. Uh, the, the market is ripe, it's ready, is aware and uh, uh, waiting for good products to be uh, rolled out. So, so please roll out now. <laughs> there was never been in the history a better time to roll out fintech products than now. So, so this is my uh, uh, first uh, uh, remark. And then uh, the uh, the the focus on on, on user experience because uh, what I've seen a lot of my friends when they put together a product, uh, the IT is the focus, and 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 they are in a rush uh, to launch out. So, so, so too much importance is not given because they are bootstrapped. They think that design is expensive uh, or uh, the user experience, uh, the, the finish, the refinements uh, can wait. Uh, but that is not the case. Uh, that is what is uh, uh, what will sell in the market. So please spend uh, time, money, effort, focus on, on refinements and user experience and uh, the designs of the products and the workflows. That is very, very important. And don't feel uh, shy to challenge the, the traditional uh, uh, workflows or the traditional uh, uh, ways in which we used to do business. A lot of them uh, can be challenged and, and there has been never a better time to challenge them now than before. Uh, so that's all from my side. Anil, a quick 30 second wrap up from you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll just keep it short. Uh, for the FinTech entrepreneurs, uh, try not to solve for the top 50 or the top 100 million. Look for the next 300 to 500 million. For the banks um, and uh, traditional uh, financing institutions, um, I'll just go back to Alok what you said earlier. Try to see risk in uh, in the with the view of uh, pricing. Um, and also, it's important. Uh, inclusion comes at a cost, and uh, it needs to be factored in. And um, um, as long as we are aware of it, uh, the sky is limit for uh, digital lending and fintech as a whole in it. Well, thanks so much, Anil and Jacob. Uh, you know, I think we are just running against our time, but this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you for being here. And Amit, thanks for having uh, put together this panel. For Bitcoin trading. Possible. Hai. Impossible. Lagi sir. Or hara to. It's possible on CoinSwitch Kuber. Download Karo or Bitcoin Me Trading Start. CoinSwitch Kuber. Sikka Chamkega. Cryptocurrency is an unregulated digital asset, not a legal tender and subject to market risks and price fluctuation risks. Where there is life, 
There is hope, there is meaning, but life has its downs, as much as its ups. Life is about challenges, life is about opportunities. Time for joy, time for celebration, and time to introspect. Thankfully, in every one of life's moments, and even beyond life itself, there's LIC. Where there is life, there's always LIC. Zindagi ke saath bhi, zindagi ke baad bhi.